Okay, welcome back everyone to Autorina TV English. Um, we have the pleasure today of once again hosting uh, Charles Shu from the Chia Collective. Um, we had already interviewed him back in March this year, and at that time we have uh, mainly focused on the issue of Taiwan. Um, but this time we will go through a bit more uh, topics. Um, Chiao Collective, for those unfamiliar, is a diaspora Chinese media established in uh, 2020 to counter the increase in intensity of the US-led aggression on China in terms of narrative and also in terms of policy. So welcome, Charles, and thanks for accepting our invitation. Fantastic. Thank you so much for inviting me again. It's a pleasure to be back. <laughs> So I would really go straight into the first question, because as you know, the, it's been a really intense week um, for politics worldwide. Um, what do you think of what happened at this week's um, BRICS summit in Kazan, in Russia? And what do you think should China's role be in this organization going forward? Yeah, so the BRICS summit in Kazan, Russia, that just concluded um is a significant event in in a number of different respects um i think it had a, a stronger explicit emphasis on uh building south south solidarity um and on multipolarity as such than uh perhaps any previous brick summit in terms of its messaging and uh this is also borne out materially by the fact that this was the first summit since the uh, expansion of BRICS in January this year uh, to include um, Iran, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, and Ethiopia as full members. Um, of course, uh, viewers will probably remember that uh, invitations were also extended to, to two other countries um, last year, Saudi Arabia and Argentina. Of course, Javier Mele, um, one of the first things he did was to withdraw um, Argentina's application after his election. And Saudi Arabia, for various reasons, uh, has yet to accept the invite. But nonetheless, it's quite significant that uh, three of these four new full members are uh, predominantly Muslim countries in West Asia and North Africa that, um, you know, by virtue of their political positioning uh, and, and their regional role are heavily engaged diplomatically and um, even militarily with uh, the effort to to stop the genocide, uh, the, the Israeli genocide in Gaza right now. Um, but their roles are kind of all over the map in some ways. They, they run the full gamut from uh, the, the role of the UAE, which, uh, you know, in some ways is diplomatic normalization and some would argue passive complicity um, with with Israel. Um, perhaps not even passive, right, uh, uh, in, in terms of direct material investment, um, but still rhetorically condemning its activities, right? Uh, to Egypt's role, which is uh, simultaneously as, as a co-enforcer of the blockade, um, but also uh, as a mediator between principally uh, Israel and Hamas, um, and, and also, you know, played a significant role in, in refusing initial plans to simply displace, uh, you know, the entire pop Palestinian population of Gaza into, into the Sinai Desert. And, you know, this, this gamut runs all the way to, to Iran's role as, as a central anchor of the, the axis of resistance, which twice now in the past year has, um, in an unprecedented fashion, uh, uh, you know, had to retaliate uh, against direct Israeli aggression by, by launching direct strikes on Israel itself. So, you know, in this regard, uh, I think it's, it's quite notable that the final summit declaration, which came out yesterday, um, while still constrained um, by the two-state framework and its support for Palestinian sovereignty, because you know, for better or worse, that that is still enshrined in uh, you know the the the, the UN um, uh, approach to this question, right? Uh, and, and because most members of BRICS uh, do have diplomatic relations with both Israel and Palestine, um, you know, even with that constraint. Uh, it's notable, I think, that this declaration calls explicitly for the uh, release of hostages and detainees from both sides, right, which is not a formulation that you'll see uh, anywhere in the West. They will uh, reserve their attention pretty much exclusively for the uh, hundred or so surviving captives, um, uh, surviving Israeli captives, right, uh, in, in 
held by Hamas and other resistance groups in Gaza, um, and not the uh, at this point more than ten thousand uh, uh, you know Palestinian political prisoners held in Israeli concentration camps. Um, in addition, this this declaration uh, reserves all specific denunciations for Israeli actions, and this goes on for pages and pages. Actually, uh, most notably. Um, the uh, September 17th pager attack uh, in Lebanon, it dubs a, quote, premeditated terrorist act, which is quite strong language um, for, you know, what we know to uh, have been, um, you know, uh, an attack directed from the highest levels of, of the Israeli political and military apparatus. Um, more generally, uh, it's notable that this summit declaration does repeatedly reaffirm the UN Charter as, uh, you know, the overall framework for resolution of armed conflicts, including those in which members of BRICS are directly involved, for example, the war in Ukraine. Um, in that regard, I think it's um, uh, especially worth noting that UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, actually traveled to Kazan to attend the summit and to meet with Putin. Um, and, you know, while I'm sure there were uh, uh, major differences of views aired in this meeting, uh, the fact that it occurred at all presents a very stark contrast um, at a time when Guterres uh, was, is being declared persona non grata uh, by Israel entirely. Um, and they are essentially waging increasingly desperate uh, public relations effort to condemn the entire United Nations uh, institution as, as anti-Semitic. Um, the declaration, uh, yeah, it also, you know, uh, given given especially um, the role of, of Russia as hosts and the general level of concern throughout the global south at the uh, weaponization of sanctions um, by the U.S. and its Western allies, uh, the, the declaration very strongly condemns and indeed calls for the elimination of um, so-called unilateral coercive measures. Uh, inter alia in the form of unilateral you know, economic sanctions and secondary sanctions that are contrary to international law. And uh, going beyond just rhetorical denunciation of this, um, the declaration uh, and the summit as a whole uh, were also um, accompanied by uh, a significant strengthening of the New Development Bank, which is um, you know, also known as the BRICS Bank, which is headquartered in Shanghai. And uh, also a rollout of the BRICS cross-border payment initiative, um, which is intended to be in some ways a, uh, an alternative to the SWIFT system out of which Russia has been locked out um, and which in principle, any other state enemy of the US could be, right? Um, uh, moving instead to, to a basket of uh, uh, local currencies of BRICS members. Um, and you know, this is a meaningful, though still very much preliminary step towards the de-dollarization of the world economy in which we can expect China as the largest economy, not just in BRICS, but in the world uh, to play an outsized role. Um, and then with regard to China in particular, um, the summit also served in many ways as a venue for China to de-escalate tensions and to strengthen ties with uh, a number of its regional neighbors in a setting that was relatively free of US interference and where, um, you know, overall diplomatic military temperatures could be could be cooled. Uh, most notably, probably, um, you know, India and China are uh, both founding members of BRICS, the, the, the I and the C. And um, so this summit actually saw the first bilateral meeting between Xi Jinping and uh, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi in five years. And this led to um, a landmark agreement on uh, military disengagement from a large section of the uh, so-called line of actual control, which is basically the de facto border. Um, uh, you know, after a number of uh, lethal clashes there in the past several years between Indian and Chinese troops. Um, so that's a major and positive development. And then, uh, you know, the summit also saw the uh, pretty intentional inclusion of Vietnam, Malaysia, and Indonesia um, as so-called BRICS partner countries. And this has occurred, uh, you know, in spite of the South China Sea territorial dispute um, between 
various combinations of those countries and uh, between China and China itself, as well as the uh, so-called uh, Republic of China or ROC in Taiwan. Um, so that I think also is, is a major step in terms of providing an, an yet another alternative forum, right? Uh, uh, one that is relatively less under U.S. influence than, for example, the ASEAN plus China uh, setting for for um, you know such disputes to be uh, uh, mediated, resolved um, without uh, the the uh, sort of direct um, influence of of the U.S. military footprint in the region. And then finally, I you know I want to point out that. Uh, even though this category of BRICS partner countries in some ways had to be concocted because um, India seems to be uh, quite reticent about expanding formal membership uh, in, in the bloc beyond the nine countries that, that are actively participating now. Um, you know, we can probably think of these this list of partner countries as, as uh, uh, the, the next ones in line, right, for formal membership. And in that regard, uh, the inclusion of Cuba and Bolivia in that list as well I think it's quite significant, um, you know, making up for uh, the loss in some ways of Argentina um, and, uh, you know, in, in political terms, arguably more than making up for that, um, because, you know, those, those two countries are very much uh, pillars of, of um, you know, the, the left bloc, uh, the progressive bloc within within Latin America, and they can expect they can be expected uh, to to strengthen like a left and progressive pull within BRICS as well uh, at a time when its expansion, you know, uh, including into um, uh, countries that you know are are implicated in in all kinds of predominantly Western led groupings as well, um, uh, some of which are military uh, uh, allies or at least proxies of the United States, um, you know, can can lead to some I think justified fear of. Of the muddling of its political character, right, um, including Cuba and Bolivia, in there, uh, I think is a, is a major positive step as well. Um, so yeah, that's uh, kind of in, in a nutshell uh, my sort of very preliminary takeaways from uh, what we saw at the BRICS summit uh, that just concluded in Kazan. Thank you, Charles. Very, very interesting. Uh, in um... In the um, reduction of uh, the um, of Ottolina TV, we had this kind of uh, argue between those uh, that uh, thought that uh, this uh, this summit uh, was um, a kind of success. Uh, others, as uh, our boss uh, Giuliano, uh, was very disappointed because, uh, uh, of course, if the um, concretely the main point is the dedollarization. Uh, from that point of view, we didn't see any step, uh, concrete step, uh, further. So, um, yes, of course, there are, uh, of course, different uh, opinions. Um, I wanted also to ask you about uh, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, military um, um, military exercitation uh, of uh, last week, because. Uh, um china conducted a military exercise ar ar around taiwan uh, simulating a naval uh, blockade of the island and um, so i wanted to ask you if um, in your opinion uh, um, we are uh, close uh, to a kind of outbreak of uh, the conflict uh, or uh, I mean, we we still uh, we still uh, luckily have to wait for it. Yeah. So um, certainly, I think a lot of uh, coverage about these drills, um, particularly in the West, seeks to uh, present them as major sort of unprovoked uh, escalations by the uh, the Chinese military. Um, and you know this this is all with the intention of of setting the stage right should should outright um armed hostilities uh uh commence of 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 presenting china sort of as the unilateral aggressor right or as as the the actor that that is uh driving the militarization of of the conflicts and um you know to this end i i think that uh, viewers, you know, who want sort of a lot more of the historical context for, for you know, how we got to this point, 
um, should look at the, the previous interview that I did uh, with you all back in March, um, and also at the uh, sort of very extensive Taiwan timeline and resource list that that was based on, and which is on our website. Um, we also have uh, a sort of condensed version of that uh, that was published in a monthly review in their uh, uh, July, August um, Indo-Pacific issue. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to get too much into that background this time. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> what we'll say is, is that is that there, there is, you know, a, a much more complicated and nuanced history to this than the Western media will will present, um, and one that's sort of systematically distorted by the, the separatist camp, right? Um, and we can maybe talk about that a little bit later in this interview as well. Uh, that said, regarding these military drills themselves, um, they uh, I would say that they're broadly in line uh, in terms of scale and geographical scope with a series of uh, previous exercises that have been conducted recently each of them in response to uh, very specific provocations by Taiwan's sort of separatist authorities. Um, you know, in particular, uh, you know, these drills, their official designation is a Joint Sword 2024B, uh, in the case that they're part of a sequence with uh, 2024A, which was conducted um, earlier this year uh, on May 23rd and 24th. Uh, so that was just like, three days after the inaugural address of um, the new uh, so-called president of the Republic of China, um, commonly referred to in Western media as president of Taiwan, though uh, this is inaccurate for uh, a number of reasons that we can get into. But, you know, uh, he, he was inaugurated uh, in on May 20th, right? Uh, his inaugural address included specific rhetoric that uh, was sort of goading a response, frankly, from from, from China uh, regarding sovereignty and independence and so on. And so, yeah, um, you know, the the drills that just occurred last week, right, um, which were mostly concentrated just in one day on October 14th, were then in direct response to his National Day speech on, on October 10th. And we can maybe get sort of later in the program into the significance of that date, uh, which also happens to, 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 to be my birthday, coincidentally. But um, you know, is, is marked as well by by the the Republic of China, right? Um, uh, of which the current authorities in Taiwan claim to be the, the continuation, um, at least officially, right? Uh, and so, yeah, you know, each of those two sets of drills in in twenty twenty four were were direct responses to to rhetorical and, and symbolic escalations, and then there was a precedent for this. Um, back in 2022, when uh, Nancy Pelosi, as sitting speaker of the House of Representatives of the United States, um, visited uh, uh, Taiwan, you know, in an official capacity in a major breach of, of diplomatic protocol. Um, and that was sort of when this precedent was set. And um, if you take a look at this map that I shared, uh, let me put it on the screen. Um, yeah, so this map was produced by the Institute for the Study of War, which is uh, very much like a Western uh, aligned think tank. Um, so mea culpa for that, but uh, you know, it, it, it is like a pretty good still graphical representation of uh, you know, what the areas of activity have been, right? And what you basically see is uh, in red, um, or sorry, in, in, in uh, sort of gray slash dark blue, um, you have the initial precedent for this, which was the uh, um, the exercises after Nancy Pelosi's visit, um, which, you, as you can see, were sort of concentrated in these like six or so areas surrounding the island of Taiwan, right? Um, and these were sort of like pre-designated, pre-announced areas where these exercises were being held, right, uh, on each of these three occasions. And then light blue, you know, you have the exercises from earlier this year in May. You know, you'll see again, uh, several uh, areas, uh, you know, in, in all directions around around the island, but also, uh, you know, that time around uh, operating in the vicinity of these various ROC held island groups that are actually way closer to uh, uh, mainland China, right? In some cases, just a few kilometers off the coast than they are to Taiwan. It's kind of a historical accident 
as to how this came to be the case. Um, but nonetheless, they're sort of like forward bases, right, um, uh, for uh, the ROC regime in Taiwan to, to in principle, like uh, uh, historically to, 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 to uh, be able to threaten the mainland, right? And, and they were originally intended almost as uh, uh, potential launching points for like a counter invasion to, to reclaim mainland China. Um, they don't really serve this function anymore, but, but you know, uh, remain for obvious geographical reasons, sources of tension, right? Um, and so a lot of these exercises in 2024 have been concentrated around these island groups, you know, in Jinmen, uh, Mazu, Wuchu, and uh, Dongin as, as well. Um, so, you know, what uh, do these exercises consist of? It's, it's by now a pretty well-established pattern. Uh, it's usually you know, one to four days of a combination of live fire drills, joint air and naval uh, operations, uh, occasionally some missile launches, and um, also, you know, uh, increasingly recently simulated landings uh, in those designated areas, right? Um, and they're, they're announced in advance and, and uh, specifically in uh, response, right, to, to, to uh, specific triggering events. And in that sense, you know, I, I suppose that even though the, the military contexts are, are very different, right, uh, you, you can think of them sort of in, in analogy almost to these like, uh, uh, in, in some ways, like highly uh, engineered and, and, and sort of scripted almost, um, uh, you know, retaliatory attacks, right, um, that are occurring against Israel uh, from various actors and acts of resistance. Uh, in response to specific provocations, you know, there, of course, it is a, a much more intense actual shooting war, right? But, you know, you'll have, like, specific operations with, like, you know, well-intended targets, obviously not uh, announced in advance there, right? Uh, other than Iran's sort of um, April retaliatory strike, where they intentionally did so. Um, but but they're each sort of announced, right, as, as a specific retaliation to a specific event. And, um, you know, also, uh, in, in the case of, of these exercises conducted by, uh, by the Chinese military in the waters around Taiwan, um, they are limited to what both uh, sort of PRC and ROC governments uh, acknowledge officially are Chinese territorial waters. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you know, because their sort of scope and scale are, are announced in advance, right? Um, that means that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's sort of, uh, abundantly clear to, to everyone involved, right? Like other militaries in the region, uh, most notably that those of the U S and of the, the, the ROC, AKA Taiwan, um, you know, which areas to avoid, right. Um, during the, you know, very specific temporally delineated, uh, delineated period of, of these uh, exercises. And so their intention then is, is to sort of establish, you know, several rungs of an escalation ladder and an equation of deterrence, right? Um, that is uh, specifically um, uh, created in, in response to both material and sort of symbolic moves uh, in the direction of unilateral independence, right? By the Taiwanese authorities. And China has repeatedly emphasized that the only condition under which it would actually pursue military unification would be a unilateral declaration of independence, right, by by the Taiwanese authorities. And, um, you know, that is a line that they seem very much not intent to cross. Um, and, you know, by now, this is, I would say, well established enough of a pattern, right? It is uh, uh, certainly, I, I would say, the, the exercise after the Pelosi visit. Um, you know, established a new equation of deterrence, but now it's a fairly well-established one. And that means that, you know, uh, in the days after these fairly predictable, almost, I, I would say, intended uh, 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 provocations, right, um, you know, both U.S. and ROC forces in the region uh, know what to expect. Um, they, you know, uh, like, even if they grouse about uh, these de facto uh, rules of engagement and this equation of deterrence, they do broadly understand and, and respect them so as to avoid armed conflict. And that means that these exercises, you know, are having the desired 
sort of short term and medium term effect of uh, basically reasserting uh, China's clear red lines surrounding independence, which are you know very much historically uh, uh, grounded, um, and thereby of actually you know sort of avoiding unexpected conflicts while you know indicating to everyone involved um, what the costs of uh, you know a major sort of uh, like you know unilateral violation of the status quo right and and the uh, international consensus around the one one China policy would actually entail. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, answer. This actually ties in to the next question that we have prepared, which is basically, what do you think about the current um, local leadership of the Republic of China, aka Taiwan, as you were saying, and how do you think that public opinion has evolved on the issue of reunification, status quo, and independence over the past few months, let's say, like, compared to our first interview a few months ago, uh, especially, like, in light that, as Lai himself has noticed, like, some famous, like, singers and artists are, I mean, working on mainland China and, like, saying happy, happy anniversary for the foundation and so on of the Republic. So how do you think? This has evolved over the few over the last few months. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think I think that like a lot of um, Western uh, coverage of of this issue uh, basically takes as a given um, that uh, public opinion, like majority public opinion in Taiwan, actually favors independence, and this is not reflected in the survey data. It, it honestly never has been. Um, and there's been really not much notable movement, um, in either direction, I would say, uh, since we last spoke, um, or, you know, in, in the sort of public survey data around this, this, this question, uh, basically from, from last year to, to this year, um, uh, to, to get into specifics, uh, according to the most recent survey, which was conducted in June of this year. Uh, there is still a solid 61% um, majority that wants to uh, either maintain the status quo indefinitely or to maintain the status quo now and then decide at a later date, right, whether whether uh, to, to offer independence or unification. Um, so that's like, you know, very much like this, this like neutral camp, right, that, that constitutes um, you know, a solid, a solid 60% of, of the population. 22% uh, of the population wants to maintain the status quo now, but move toward independence specifically. So basically gradual moves toward independence. And then less than 4% want independence immediately. So, you know, if we, if we think of those last two, right, the 22% who want to move gradually, the 4% or so who want, you know, immediate independence as like a single block, um, then this pro-independence camp, right, which which today still is just a quarter of the total population, has actually lost ground uh, by a cumulative five or six percent or so since 2020, um, when it achieved its sort of peak. And um, this is despite the fact that uh, you know the the leaders of that camp, right, the the current ruling party, the Democratic Progressive Party, um, helmed by uh, the the president uh, Lai Qingde. Um, they've maintained a struggle, stranglehold on executive power um, this this whole time, right? Uh, you know, they avoided what in in recent decades has has been termed like a two term curse, right, for ruling parties, um, by electing Lai Qingde as 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 uh, president uh, in in January um, after two terms under his his predecessor Tsai Ing Wen, right? So this is their third term in power, um, but the only reason it happened this time around was because they faced a divided opposition. And so Lai Qingde won with about 40% of the popular vote, um, you know, because uh, that, that was all he needed, right, as, as a plurality. Um, and they actually lost their majority in the, the uh, legislative uh, UN, right, the legislature of, of the island. And um, this is pretty notable because you know, uh, like over pro independence sentiment in this sense, right? Like, like in terms of like this is the political road that we want to go down. Um, it's still stalled at about a quarter of the population, in spite of uh, over two decades of very concerted 
um, you know, fully U.S. backed ideological conditioning um, in favor of overt desanitization, right? Like telling people not to identify as Chinese, not to identify with China and the propagation of a separatist ideology that includes, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, a, a, a full blown sort of historical revisionist narrative, right? Um, <clears throat> surrounding this sort of like trans historical uh, separateness of Taiwan from China. Um, and, uh, you know, including most notably, I would say whitewashing of Japanese colonial rule as, you know, uh, 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 you know, a recent period, right? Um, a, a sort of precedent uh, for the political separation of, of Taiwan from China, like forcibly, right? As, as, an, as a literal colony. Um, I discussed this more in my last appearance, but it's, it's, it's like helpful um, uh, basic historical background, I think, um, for, you know, understanding precisely why uh, Lai Tinda's rhetoric um, in particularly those two speeches, right, that, that triggered the most recent rounds of military exercises has been so intentionally provocative. Um, uh, and, and, and why, you know, this, this kind of repeated behavior of, of Emu is pointlessly goading the People's Republic of China with what is actually like self-contradictory rhetoric, right? That, that swings from separatist to like sort of in some ways ROC chauvinist, you know, is, is actually out of step with the majority of, of the Taiwanese people. Um, specific examples of this from, from those two speeches in question, uh, in his inaugural address, uh, on May 20th. Um, Lai Chinda referred to Taiwan as, quote, a sovereign independent nation. Uh, he's, uh, in this sense, the first uh, person in his office uh, to have done so publicly, right, um, in, in their inaugural address. Um, so that was a major rhetorical escalation, uh, probably the most noticeable one, right, from, from uh, the mainland perspective. But, uh, you know, other other bits of this speech that I think would be of interest, you know, he explicitly welcomed uh, the U.S. militarization of the region through the Indo-Pacific Security Supplemental Appropriations Act, right, which um, uh, really boosted uh, the level of arms sales uh, to uh, Taiwan. And uh, towards the end, um, very weirdly, right, uh, he noted that, you know, uh, it's the 400th uh, anniversary of the uh, Dutch colonization of Taiwan in 1624. And he, um, he named this like simply as Taiwan's quote, first links to globalization. So, you know, uh, part of a, um, a, a consistent project of, of sort of like whitewashing and he's sort of celebrating, uh, you know, like various periods of colonial rule that, that mark Taiwan as distinct from, from mainland China, like going back way before the Japanese period and, and, and even to the first days of European colonization, right? Um, sort of retroactively uh, uh, imprinting this, this ideology, right? Uh, that's quite redolent in, in, in the separatist camp of thinking of, them, of themselves as, as um, you know, distinct from and uh, in many ways like culturally sort of superior to mainland China by virtue of having been, you know, colonized by these, um, uh, these external powers. So, you know, that was his inaugural address. And then more recently in the uh, lead up to the National Day of the Republic of China, October 10th, um, which is a, a holiday that, that it, com it commemorates the uh, Wuchang uprising, um, which uh, essentially um, what was 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 the the first um, uh, the first you know like trigger for for uh, what later became known as the Xinhai Revolution in 1911, which overthrew which overthrew the last uh, imperial dynasty, right, the Qing Dynasty, and uh, led to the uh, establishment of the Republic of China. Um, and yes, so you know. It, it's it's notable that like when this happened in 1911, right? The the actual event being commemorated, uh, Taiwan was uh, politically speaking not part of the um, uh, the territory that was liberated from from uh, you know imperial Qing rule because it had actually been forcibly removed from it, right? Uh, you know by like Japanese colonialists 
um, uh, about 16 years earlier, uh, after the first Sino-Japanese War. And so Taiwan itself was, 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 a, was a, uh, you know, a colony of Japan at the time. And, um, in fact, the form that its liberation from Japanese colonial rule took in 1945 after the, the sort of final defeat of Japan was precisely to be reunified, uh, with, um, uh, you know, the, the Republic of China, uh, on the mainland, right? Um, but that's that's a history that you know sits uneasily uh, with the separatist narrative, right? Um, and this kind of illustrates the the uh, really kind of self contradictory nature of of uh, Lai Chindo's rhetoric, because he sort of again repeat repeated this this uh, uh, line about you know he he's he's very wishy washy about whether he's referring to Taiwan or the Republic of China, right? Um, he repeated this line about it being a sovereign, independent nation, and then in, in the lead up to the day itself, you know, he um, made a very curious assertion. Uh, I'll just quote it directly. He said, "Quote: In terms of age, it is absolutely impossible for the People's Republic of China to become the motherland of the Republic of China's people. On the contrary, the Republic of China may be the motherland of the people of the People's Republic of China." Um, and he's basically saying there, you know, the ROC was founded in 1911, the PRC was founded in 1949, you know, uh, by virtue of 1911 being earlier, right? Um, uh, like, he, he was essentially saying that, like, you know, like, the government that he heads, right, which claims to be the direct successor um, of the, uh, the the Republic of China, which, which used to rule both mainland China and Taiwan, um, has a stronger claim, right? Even even in its like rump form, you know, backed by the U.S. military on this island readout of Taiwan, that, you know, uh, this, this, you know, he, he was he was essentially simultaneously saying that like, oh, Taiwan as such is is sovereign and independent and separate from China, but also you know holding on to this claim more more commonly associated with the the Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party, right, the, the current opposition party. That in fact uh, the, the ROC remains in some ways like a legitimate or more legitimate government of all of China, right, including the mainland. So um, you know this this sits uncomfortably with 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 you know his own sort of historical leanings, and in in terms of attempting to continue to lay claim to the legacy of that re original revolution in 1911, right, which established the ROC, you know he he very intentionally distorts history and ignores the um, direct revolutionary continuity between 1911 and 1949, right? And, uh, you know, what I think most Chinese people would, would certainly say is the People's Republic's much stronger claim to be the, the legitimate successor to the Republic of China in its original instantiation, as envisioned by Sun Yat-sen, right? It's, it's founding precedent. Um, you know, in particular, you know, his, his ideology, which, which, which was uh, uh, grounded, uh, you know, some would say, in, in, in um, a sort of like proto-socialist uh, and certainly very, you know, uh, anti-imperialist vision, right? Um, which has, you know, been betrayed by his immediate successor, Chiang Kai-shek, and, 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 and the regime that he established uh, uh, first in, in all of China and then, and then, and then fleeing to Taiwan in 1949. And uh, as Chow Collective, we, we actually posted like a thread on Twitter um, on October 10th, right? So it's still fairly recent. You can go and check it out on our feed um, at Chow Collective, but, you know, kind of delving more into the actual history and how, um, you know, there are all these direct linkages between uh, Sun Yat-sen and the people in his party, right? The, the, the Kuomintang, the KMT, the nationalists, um, who, uh, you know, early on after the, after Chiang Kai-shek's purge of the communists realized that in fact, the Communist Party of China you know, was sort of carrying on that revolutionary legacy um, and uh, ultimately ended up, um, <clears throat> you know, kind of defecting from the KMT to the communists, right? And establishing many direct uh, personal and organizational linkages uh, uh, from the Republic to the People's Republic uh, in a way that I think like thoroughly um, uh, refutes this revisionist historical narrative that Lai Chinda is putting forward. Um, so yeah, uh, I can't speak as much to, you know, what's 
been going on in terms of purely domestic policy um, in in Taiwan uh, under you know uh, under under uh, Lai Qingde's governance under under the DPP's current third term in power. Um, uh, but but these are essentially the flashpoints, right? Uh, that uh, represent like actually, you know, significant and meaningful escalations in terms of rhetoric uh, uh, and, and quite intentional provocations um, and, and to which, you know, the, the People's Republic uh, and its military have, have been responding, right, by, by reasserting their red lines um, and by conducting these, these exercises, uh, you know, essentially as, as deterrence, right, for, for further moves in, in this direction. But, you know, um, I guess the upshot is that uh, other than, you know, these kind of like symbolic shifts in, in rhetoric, which are really just an intensification of, of what, um, you know, his, his party was already saying. Uh, and, um, and also, you know, the repetition of, of these exercises for which there was already precedent, right? Um, you know, it, it doesn't seem that there has been, at least in the past several months, that major of a shift in public opinion, um, the majority still favors the preservation of the status quo. And, you know, while uh, I think uh, the, you know, the, the PRC does see that status quo as probably untenable in the long term, um, you know, it uh, also very much prefers it, right, to further moves in the direction of unilateral independence. And, um, you know, if it finds eventually uh, uh, an interlocutor, a partner, right, um, uh, across the Taiwan Strait, uh, with a common interest in preserving that status quo, the PRC will not be the actor that will unilaterally uh, overturn that through military escalation. Clear. Um, Charles, in conclusion, um, I wanted to uh, ask you about this uh, report that you published with the Xiao Collective. Uh, I wanted to show it. The gates of the great continent, Palestine, China, and the war for humanity's future. Because uh, in this essay, you go into the relationship uh, between uh, Palestine and uh, China. And uh, I found it really, really interesting. And uh, I wanted to ask you if uh, you can uh, uh, talk about it for these last uh, five minutes. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the. This 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 piece um, was basically written by me personally, um, so a little bit different from the Taiwan resource list, which is very much a collaborative effort uh, among all of us in Chow. Um, though you know, do credit to to all of my comrades for for their assistance in, in research and editing and so on. Um, I guess one of the original impetuses, right, for uh, the way that I was thinking about. Palestine, China, and their relationship, um, you know, it, it, like in the process of formulating this article, uh, was this uh, quote, right, from Mao Zedong um, in uh, 1965, when he was uh, speaking to a visiting delegation of the Palestine Liberation Organization. This was shortly after China had become uh, the very first non-Arab country to Okay, we lost Charles. Oh no, here we are. Here we are. Charles, we lost you for a second. Ah, sorry about that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> please, please. Okay. Yes. So, um, yeah, I don't know quite where uh, I, I dropped off, but I was. No, no, was... just just for a second, so okay. you can. Uh... Okay, great. Yes. So, so this this quote from Mao um, was in some ways like the original inspiration for this article. Um, and it actually is kind of a bridge between, you know, uh, the the main subject of of this conversation, as well as, well as our previous one, right, namely Taiwan, and and Palestine. Um, you know, what it, it's the quote that sort of opens uh, my article, and uh, yes, so it's right there on the screen. Uh, as as Mao said to this visiting PLO delegation, he said, "quote Imperialism is afraid of China and of the Arabs. Israel and Formosa, that's the antiquated name for Taiwan." Our bases of imperialism in Asia. You are the gate of the great continent, and we are the rear. They created Israel for you and Formosa for us. Their goal is the same. 
Um, so I think this is very illuminating um, because uh, it, you know, for, for me, it represented uh, in many ways like a, a more concrete um, basis for for this story of historical solidarity, right? Than uh, you know the the purely rhetorical, right? Like oh, you know, we share the same enemy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it's very geographically grounded, right? And uh, it 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 centers in, in many ways on on the fact that um, yes, as, as you put it, right? Like. Palestine and China uh, are at opposite ends of of you know of Asia, right? Of the Great Continent, as 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 you put it, um, you know the the imagery of of you know the the front and the rear gate, right? Uh, is is uh, is very arresting, and you know it informed kind of the way that we illustrated that article, um, but 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 also uh, I think communicates an understanding of the centrality of Palestine, right? It, you know its its location. Uh, sort of at this crossroads of of Asia and Africa, and also you know very close to Europe, right? Um, which which has you know been a major historical historical significance on top of its religious significance, right? For for uh, uh, all three Abrahamic faiths, um, you know, from you know at least at least the days of the the, the Crusades, right? Um, and uh, it, it, it also indicates that this relationship, right, and and in particular the centrality of Palestine to uh, to world revolution um, and 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 to the sort of global anti imperialist struggle, uh, you know, is in many ways it, it's actually the fulcrum, right, of of a sort of like pan Asian revolutionary struggle, uh, and and that I found to be quite stri striking, right, that 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 he said like you're the front gate, we are the rear. You know, um, even though the Chinese Revolution, like, uh, you know, as this epical event had had uh, really expanded the reach of socialism to, to so many more people than ever before in history. Um, it also indicates the parallel, uh, uh, you know, utility, right, of, of having these these essentially like implanted imperialist proxies as as bases, um, you know, Israel on the one hand and the ROC. Uh, uh, puppet regime of the U.S. in Taiwan on the other, and indeed, you know, this is something that that the imperialists themselves have have noted in terms of the the very like shared language that they use to to uh, describe the two. Right, uh, Douglas MacArthur in 1950, for example, um, like towards the very start of the Korean War, arguing for the U.S. to uh, uh, actually actively defend Taiwan from liberation by the communists. Um, you know, which really entrenched his political separation from from the mainland. He he, you know, wrote in a memo to uh, uh, President Harry Truman that quote Formosa in the hands of the communists can be compared to an unsinkable aircraft carrier, right? And then in reference to Israel, uh, uh, Reagan's Secretary of State in 1981, Alexander Haig, um, used very similar language. He said Israel is the largest American aircraft carrier in the world that cannot be sunk, does not carry even one American soldier. And is located in a critical region for American national security. So, you know, uh, basically because because the imperialists are thinking in these in these common sort of geographical terms, right, um, uh, about the function of of you know their bases, that means that the uh, uh, you know struggle both to to reunify China, right, uh, fully to complete the reunification of China. And um, also to liberate Palestine from settler colonialism, uh, you know, like ought to proceed in full solidarity and in tandem with each other as well. And uh, the purpose of the article, you know, on the one hand, was to trace the way that this played out historically, right? As as I mentioned, China was the first uh, non-Arab country to recognize the PLO. It was also its main. Um, uh, diplomatic sponsor and arms supplier for the first decade when when the the PLO was most active in terms of um, in terms of uh, guerrilla struggle right um, and so it's sort of tracing uh, that relationship it's tracing the people to people exchange right I uncovered a number of occasions where where you know the uh, uh, you know famous Palestinian writer and spokesperson for the PFLP Kasan Kanafani actually traveled to China. Um, and and uh, helped to inaugurate some of these exchanges, um, and you know I was, I was also illustrating how they uh, uh, in many ways endured you know beyond the Mao period right and and into this period of of 
you know, sort of uh, rapprochement with the U.S., um, you know, uh, a, a certain, you know, reversal or retreat in some ways from, from foreign policy militancy, right? Um, proceeding in parallel with the PLO's uh, own sort of slide into normalization with Israel, you know, uh, during the Oslo Accords, right? And how this paved the way for China, as well as many other countries in, in the global south that were stalwart allies of Palestine to, to do the same. Um, but nonetheless, you know, uh, what I'm seeing in the current moment um, and what I point out in the article is, uh, you know, I think a certain continuity between the now period and now in terms of China's continued overt support for uh, armed struggle as a legitimate um, means, right, to achieve the end of Palestinian liberation, uh, as as you saw, you know, for example, recently at the the International Court of Justice, uh, the fact that it maintains good relationships with all Palestinian factions, um, you know, both uh, uh, Fatah and uh, these resistance formations, right, thirteen others uh, that came together. In, in Beijing uh, uh, and, and put out this unity declaration in, in July, right? Committing to a national unity government, committing to a pathway towards, towards liberation um, in, in ways that were very much parallel, I would say, uh, to, and, 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 and from China's stance, like probably informed by, right? Um, like the own historical trajectory of the Communist Party, uh, which, you know, like, partnered tactically with their bitter enemies in, in the Kuomintang, in the nationalists, right, uh, uh, to achieve the cause of national liberation from imperialism, uh, from feudalism, from Japanese colonialism, uh, before then prevailing over uh, uh, their, their erstwhile uh, allies, right, um, in, in the Civil War. And, um, you know, so, so, so beyond that as well, you know, I was, I was looking as well at the, you um, uh, the actual dynamics, right, and the, the theory and the practice of, of guerrilla war as we have um, seen them play out in the past year of, of resistance to genocide occurring, you know, not just in the Gaza Strip, right, um, and and in this, you know, sort of vast popular cradle for it that, that Israel is, is uh, quite intentionally trying to destroy, particularly now, um, you know, with its uh, campaign of extermination in, in North Gaza, um, but also, you know, regionally with axis of resistance, right? I, I'm, I was looking at it sort of through this lens of, of um, you know, base areas, right? And of encirclement and counter encirclement, uh, all this language that we uh, uh, inherit, right? From, from Mao's writings on the guerrilla war, but looking at how they're actually being put into practice and materially advanced, right, and updated for the 21st century by the Palestinian resistance and its regional allies uh, today. And then I was also thinking about the centrality of, um, of uh, you know, technological innovation and in particular of homegrown sort of indigenous uh, manufacturing of arms, uh, you know, which has been able to sustain uh, this guerrilla war effort in Gaza for, for over a year now, right? Um, and which is truly, you know, an, an extraordinary feat uh, under these, these uh, already, like, extremely um, onerous and, and quasi-genocidal conditions of, of siege and blockade that preceded October 7th. Um, but it really has been the backbone of the continued ability of the Palestinian people to resist and that kind of commitment to sovereign technological development in the context of people's war, right, uh, uh, is, 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 is one that, you know, I would say also has its historical precedent in the experience of, of um, the Communist Party of China in its, you know, red base areas all the way from, from the, the, the early days of the Civil War, uh, but I mean, it was continuing forward even past the revolution of 1949 in various phases, right? Um, this this commit this you know continued commitment to technological sovereignty right uh, and self sufficiency and um, you know like a uh, I guess you know a vision of of development and of modernization that was like quite overtly politicized and that may have been you know uh, to, to some extent like uh, depoliticized or brought more into conformity with uh, with Western norms right. Uh, international norms, if you will, during the reform and opening period, but in a way that still very much preserved China's um, 
uh, sovereignty, right? Its ability to delink, particularly from uh, Western platform monopolies in the realm of, of social media, right? Uh, in in such a way that that you know the only country that compares to the United States today in terms of its actual degree of digital sovereignty is China. Uh, this is a result of you know a very intentional strategy and. You know uh, what I was sort of looking at towards the end was was the way in which that this actually like dovetails with the pursuit of um, technological sovereignty on the ground in the realm of 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 both uh, uh, social reproduction and arms production, right? In the Palestinian resistance, um, so as to create an information environment, right, uh, uh, behind the so-called Great Firewall, covering like all billion or so. Uh, internet users in China that, you know, uh, is, is it, you know, like way freer, ironically, of, of the kinds of censorship that we've seen on Western platform, um, like, like social media platforms, right? Um, and therefore way more hostile to Zionist Hasbara, though, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing it uh, very much on the back foot, you know, even, even on these Western platforms as well, right? Um, and yeah, so so in some ways, that part of the article was was the most speculative, uh, uh, or or you know drawing perhaps the the um, uh, the most um, uh, yeah yeah like 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 you know drawing dr dr drawing parallels that 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 may be a bit of a reach, right? But but I hope I made sort of a compelling case that that there are meaningful parallels there, and that you know even in the absence of a sort of like coordinated, like, you know, uh, uh, I guess, um, effort, right, by all different counter hegemonic forces today, you know, ranging from the axis of resistance, uh, you know, directly confronting the genocide in Gaza to, you know, the broader sort of all these broader forums for the global south, including BRICS, right, to, 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 to bring it back to where we started in this conversation. You know, even though there are all these internal, you know, contradictions, right? There are different, um, I guess, like uh, uh, formal diplomatic and geopolitical positionings, uh, you know, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, Israel as 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 a, a, a you know a state entity in Palestine, right? Um, there there remains, you know, like a shared interest in uh, breaking the hegemony of uh, the United States and the ruling order that it leads. Uh, which, you know, is really instantiating in its most, you know, uh, violent and genocidal form in the Israeli settler colony today, right? And resisting it on all fronts uh, in ways that mutually reinforce each other, you know, uh, whether that be militarily, you know, uh, uh, in, in the actual region, you know, economically in terms of uh, uh, China and Russia's, um, you know, increasing sort of trade uh, uh, with with Iran, right, which can then materially sustain the axis of resistance and, you know, in the realm of information warfare uh, as well. So, you know, I was sort of just trying to tie all these different strands together. And, um, uh, you know, this, the article came out all the way back in March. There have been developments since then um, that that certainly uh, have been of note. Um, but I think by and large, it still, it still holds up. And, uh, you know, for any uh, listeners, viewers uh, who are curious um, and haven't had a chance to read it yet, I would very much encourage them to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Shasta. Um Also, please tell us when you when you publish uh, something new in uh, on your sites, because uh, I had to, to present it and uh, to talk, uh, talk about it with you. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to Charles and to the Xia Collective. Uh, thank you to Federico uh, and thank you everybody for uh, listening to us and I hope you see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.